the Lord bless you, brethren beloved. Let me take this time to welcome all the saints of God, all our visitors uh, to another Bible study. We're happy to have all of us participating in looking at and drilling into the Word of God. Happy to be back with us, amen, on this Wednesday evening. I'd like to say thanks, sincere thanks to Elder Everton Bailey, who just finished a series, a very profound series, looking at doctrines, the doctrine of the Bible, the doctrine of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we appreciate the time that he took to put it together, get into the word and present it to the people of God. We thank you, saints, for receiving, amen, the word. And it is important that we recognize the significance and the impact of Bible study. And we therefore thank you for week after week after week tuning in so that our souls can be blessed and we can be edified and we can uh, find it certainly from the word of God to move so that our walk please the almighty God. And we go into a study this evening. Uh, this evening we will do more or less a kind of introduction and present some facts and so forth but we are going to be embarking for a relatively uh, brief period uh, on an area in the bible and it's close to what was done before but yet very far uh, we are going to be looking at the book of revelation um, i've been asked to 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 do some presentation on revelation by some other assemblies. And if we are going to do it, I'd want to take us, our local assembly, through some of the very crucial, very important things that are outlined in Revelation. Now, when we talk about the book of Revelation, I want us to clear our minds somewhat. Because earlier this year, we spent quite a bit of time looking at Bible prophecy. And I would like to distinguish so that we can understand that Bible prophecy by itself and the book of Revelation are two different things. So we are not going to be going to Bible prophecy or even the sections in Revelation that deals with prophecy. We have done prophecy already. So when we did Bible prophecy, we looked at the book of the Old Testament. We looked at <clears throat> Daniel and Revelation. We looked at other books and we put the whole thing together to see all the prophecies, the fulfillments, the future, the prophecies that are to come and things that are yet to be fulfilled. But in looking at the book of Revelation, we are going to be drilling and delving into different things. And it is important as people of God that we understand. Yes, we might touch upon uh, things that are to come, because Revelation speaks to that. But I want to put a perspective in our minds so that we understand clearly, we understand easily that a lot of the things that are to come that causes saints to be perturbed, to be uh, troubled, it is important that we understand by looking at the book of Revelation and going through its pages that the things that are to come are things that we ought to be happy about and we ought to be giving thanks about because they are signaling some things greater to come. The consideration that we will make and the things that we will discuss and the path that we will trod will indicate clearly and succinctly that this book is not the revelation of John, the Apostle John, 
orators, the writers who penned the New Testament wrote the revelation of John the Divine. No, no, no. It is, on the contrary, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we are going to see some things. We are going to understand some things. And this book, its intent, separate and apart from revealing or unveiling Jesus Christ our Lord, it is a book that encourages and gives the saints uh, that great anticipation of the massive and great and awesome event that is to come, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I would like us to take the time out and to bit by bit go through this Bible study series on revelation. It's going to be quick and at the same time it's going to I pray, minister to us to the extent that we see who we are, we see where we are, we see who we are expecting. With all the things that are happening around, we are going to see the real picture, the bigger picture. Now, I say that against the background, brothers and sisters, if I might step back a little bit. Earlier this year, we spent some time and we had gone through, as I said, a, B a Bible study series on end times. And end times, in light of the pandemic, as we see, has caused a lot of concerns. Folks that are unsaved, folks that are saved, are troubled, perplexed, and in some instances, bewildered at the things that are happening in our world today. There was a time when some things were happening in certain parts of the world. There was a time when it was just a local situation and we would say, boy, it is just a sign of the time, but we would not be perturbed. But I have found that there are many of God's children that right now are troubled and are perplexed and are bewildered and are perturbed at the things that are happening around us. And what it suggests is that for one reason or another, we are on the side or on a side that we ought not to be. Because if, and I do believe they are, the things that are happening in our system, our world system at this present time are reflecting activities and events of the end times, then it ought to be that where the children of God are concerned, we ought to be vibrant, we ought to be expectant, we ought to be ready for the last Two or three days, I was in the country yesterday and driving on my way back from Montego Bay until I reached home. I was literally singing just one song. And I got up again this morning and I was just singing the same song. It's not a familiar song in our circle, but it's one of those songs that is sung in Pentecost over and over again. It says, ready to leave. In the twinkling of an eye. It's a beautiful song. And I'm going to talk to the, the music director and those in charge for them to have us to learn this song. It's a beautiful song. And it speaks to an imminent event that is to come. And we are to be ready to leave in the twinkling of an eye. It sounds funny. It sounds as if it is... I, I don't know, I can't find a term to describe it, but brethren, it is a fact that is coming, is imminent, very near. And at this stage, at this point, we ought to be ready to leave in the twinkling of an eye. And I was making the point that earlier when we were going through Bible prophecy and we started to look at the things that were to come, 
ominous signs that are just rolling onto the stage of earth, onto the scene of this act, if I might put it that way. And the, those ominous things cause many to be worried and to be wondering what is he talking about the horsemen are coming and the red horse and the, 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 the white horse and the pale horse and the black horse and somehow it paints a picture of gloom it paints a picture that what is coming is catastrophe and all and as a result of hearing it over and over Guess what has happened to many? They have become afraid. God's people have become uh, as if they are hiding in a closet. Can't face the world and the, thing that, the things that are confronting them in life. But that ought not to be. This is the moment that the church over the centuries have been waiting for. Things coming together. Things starting to happen. That signals the, the beginning of the end, so to speak. And it is in an environment like this that brothers and sisters, saints of the Most High God, the people of God ought to thrive. We are to be on, 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 on the mountain tops now. We are to be on our P's and Q's. This is our moment. This is the time for us to shine if we understand what is happening. So as we go through the book of Revelation, we are going through so that the things that are there, Jesus intended for them to be unveiled, to be revealed, to be manifest to the people of God. It is not a book that is hidden. It is not a book of dark things. And hard speeches that cannot be understood and therefore ought to be left alone. By virtue of its very name. And we look at that as we go in and delve in in a moment or so. But I want to make the point clear. Solidly clear. That the things that we had heard about early in the year when we were looking at the end times and the things that we will read about as we do the book of Revelation or the part of the book that we will do, it is important that we understand that this is not to cause the saints to tremble and quake. And even if we tremble and quake, it signals that we must find the altars and make it right with Almighty God. As we look into the book, we will see where it says grace and peace. And it is important to look at the sequencing. It says grace, then it says peace. It didn't say peace and then grace. Because we can never have peace until we first find and have the grace of God that brings salvation. And it is only when that grace is applied and we have it that the peace will come. And so it is important to understand these things are not here to scare us. But the Lord imparted peace. And he said grace and peace in the book of Revelation. So as we read and as we understand what is to come and things that are going to unfold... It is my prayer that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the peace that follow be ours. Yes? So that we can be prepared, we can be ready to leave in the twinkling of an eye and ready to say to this world, good, bye. Now is the time to sever ties. Now is the time more than any other time to detach the linkages. Now is the time, brothers and sisters, beloved, more than any other time to burn the bridges behind us. Now is that time. So we are going to journey through the book. And we are going to look at some things. 
and we are going to recognize that the things that we spent a lot of time highlighting was just to highlight them because they were coming. But we were never to leave believing that these mountains of horrific things that are to come were the real deal in terms of the major event in the end times and what Revelation is speaking about when it talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ. These are things that are to come. But there is an event bigger than the four horsemen that are coming. There is an event bigger than all the trumpets the, and, and all the vials that are going to be poured out and all these things that were spoken about in this book of Revelation. There is an event that is bigger than all all of them combined and as we go through the book we will see it revealed and it will bring blessed assurance to the hearts of God's people yes and that is the intent and I want every one of us that name the name of Jesus every one of us to take our time every one of us to be diligent every one of us to be faithful and take our time and go through and apply and embrace and hold on. Our Lord is coming soon and we ought not to be trembling. We ought to be preparing. We ought to be ready, waiting. And I urge and implore all my father's children, to make your calling and election sure, very important. It is my desire that every one of us make it in the rapture. None of us ought to be left behind. If we are left behind, it is our fault. If we are left behind, it is, as the song would say, too late, and it would still be our fault. But I want us to get ready. I want us to put aside the things that are to be put aside and understand that now is the time. Too much is happening. We are seeing so much. Yes? Uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening even now because folks had glossed over it earlier. We have spent enough time. But just to make the point or reinforce the point, Brethren, take these days that we are living in seriously. These are not normal times. It is almost unheard of that something like this kind of pandemic could be going on at this pace since last year, March, thereabouts. And it has not eased up. And while some countries in the world are settling down, there are many. It is as if it is a cycle and it starts all over again. To the extent that right now folks are uncertain if things will come back to normal as it was before. In fact, those that are predictors of um, future activities and events based on whatever algorithm they use and whatever they look back at and plug into their program, they have made the profound statements that things will not be the same again. The world has shifted. And therefore they say it is possible that folks won't have to go back into the workplace and sit around a desk and have the jobs that they once had. Those very soon are going to be a thing of the past. They have predicted that folks won't need to go to the store again or go to the mall to buy clothes and so forth. It's all going to be online. You put everything and you 
swipe your card, you pay for it and they put the thing in a trolley online, they send it to a spot, it is packed in a box and it is sent to your home. You don't have to leave your house to go to the supermarket, they say in a while. You won't have to leave your home to go to, to the restaurant. You won't have to leave your home to go to work. You won't have to leave your home to go to buy clothes, everything. So you're going to be locked in at home. Get used to it, they're saying. Because in the same way that there are lockdown days now and you can't leave your home, you are going to be locked in and things will come to you. So the social uh, fabric, fabric of society as we know it, the social interaction, you going to places to meet with friends, those are things they say might become things of the past. It's, it's, it's emerging into a new world and many things are changing. And what we were accustomed to, we might not be seeing that. We might not be experiencing that going forward. And so a lot of folks are fearful and wondering, uh, even within the church, because 50 at a time now, it might be removed in terms of the restrictions, and, but removed to what? 70, 80, 100? Folks are even wondering if church is going to be the same as it was before. Can we accommodate the large numbers that we once had and just have the Holy Ghost fall like fire and folks just lift hands and worship God together in one place with a large congregation? Folks are wondering. It's uncertain what tomorrow holds. But we knew that these days were coming. And folks that are frightened, folks that are nervous, I would like for all of us to understand, even if we don't understand everything that is happening, I want us to understand this fact that God is in charge. It is in the book of Acts, chapter 15, and about verse 18. It says, Known unto God are all his works from the foundation, from the beginning of this world. He knows it. So that what is happening now, and we are skipping about and wondering what this means, and we are worried about what tomorrow will hold. We don't need to be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. What we are seeing here are manifestations, things happening that fits into God's program. Nothing that's happening now caught God off guard, brothers and sisters. Nothing that is happening now has caught God by surprise. These are fitting into the program and agenda of God. You would have heard us, heard us saying many times that there is an agenda that certain people has on this earth to propel the, propel the world into a certain position with certain activities. The agenda to depopulate the earth, the agenda to, do, to, 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 to cause food to be rationed in some areas, the agenda to get rid of people at a certain age. There, there's a lot of agenda. And you'd have heard us talking about men who have established these agendas and have set times for them to be implemented. And it is a fact, it is known that what is happening now with the dislocation that we are seeing with economies around the world, it is known and it was shown that this was something on the agenda for dec decades ago. There were plans as to what will happen in 2020 and we constantly heard about 2020 30, 40 years ago. 
when 2020 sounded like eternity future. Now, exactly in the year 2020, the, a certain kind of catastrophe came. And it is a fact. I make the point, brothers and sisters, that it is easy for us to lose sight of Jesus and the things of God and focus on pandemic, focus on shortage of food, focus on high food price, focus on everything going up, and focus on everything else to the exclusion of the one who matters most. So the book of Revelation is going to show us, beloved, that we must have and maintain the right focus because the Jesus that we serve is large and he's in charge and he's sovereign and he's answerable to no man and no man can upset his program and his agenda. Rest assured of that. And it is with that that we are going to take a journey through aspects of the book of Revelation. And I want us to tune in and understand. Let us turn in our Bibles and we'll put it on the screen. Revelation chapter number 1, verses 1 to 3. And we are going to read this, amen, together. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who be record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. For the time is at hand. Brothers and sisters, um, it is important for us to understand, to recognize that the book of Revelation is not as many would have indicated. Is a book hard to understand? Is a book full of mystery? We are not to proceed to try to drill into it and to teach from it because it is only going to cause people to be mixed up and to be confused. Let us just leave what don't trouble us. There are so many other books in the Bible that we can read and be edified from than to go and take up and trouble the book of Revelation. But if we take that positioning, that position, if we take that approach to looking at this powerful book, we would be doing ourselves a great disservice because the Bible tells us that blessed, it is, it, it is a book just by reading it, a blessing is pronounced upon you. Just by hearing the words of the prophecy of the book, a blessing is pronounced upon you. And then those that keep the sayings of the things of the book, Blessed, happy, a blessing is imparted to those that read, that hear, and that keep the thing. So that for God to pronounce a blessing upon us for reading it and hearing it, which means understanding it and then keeping the saying, it means that he knows it is the intention of God for us to read it, and to understand it and to keep the things that are therein 
so that we can receive the blessing that comes with the book. And so we can discard, we can put aside the particular philosophy that says to leave this book. It is a part of the New Testament writings, saints of the Most High God, and therefore it ought to be a part of what we read and what we study and what we seek to follow as a legitimate part of the words of Almighty God. So away and put aside those thoughts and positions that suggest that it ought not to be a book that we, we, we pay too much attention to. It is a critical book in the New Testament writings. And I'd like us to know, as we take our time and go through, that is the, it is the culmination. This book of Revelation is the culmination of all of Bible prophecy throughout the ages. So what we spoke about, what is there in Genesis? Genesis talk about the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And then Shiloh came and it made prophetic utterances about the one that was to come who was Messiah. And we all know that Messiah came and then that he died and that he went away. And then Messiah is coming back. We, we know the whole thing coming down the line. The book of Revelation is the culmination of all the prophetic events, utterances, yes, from the Old Testament coming through over into the New Testament. They all culminate in the book of Revelation. And all the prophecies of the ages find their finality. In Revelation, it is therefore important and imperative that we have a good and a clear understanding of this book so that we can have a good picture, brothers and sisters, of the things that are to come. And Revelation is therefore that book that we must look at. Also, it discloses the future of the Jews, of the Gentiles, and of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. A book that must not be ignored. Its pages reveal the Savior's return, the millennium period and all that will be happening therein. And then the final state of those that are going to be existing, which is all of us. It, the final state, as in those that will be in eternity with God, and the final state, as in those that will be in eternity, in a devil's hell. All of these things, the eternal state, the millennial period, the return of Jesus Christ, the Jews, the Gentiles, the church of Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of prophecy, all of these things and more are found in the book of Revelation. It is therefore clear to us that it is a book for us to look at to examine closely, to study, and to appreciate. Now, for those who believe that Revelation is a hidden book, it goes totally against what Revelation itself actually means. The, 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 the word Revelation, as we have here, is from a Greek word, apocalypsis which means to unveil, to unmask, to reveal. So that the very title of the book, Revelation, means to reveal and to, to make known. It is therefore not to hide. And notice the verb. It is singular. It is the revelation, not the revelations. So that all the things that we will look at 
in as much as they are different things, they all add up to bring out one main thing. That is the revelation. So all of them, these things, make up one revelation. And it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we will drill a little bit to find out exactly what the main event, the main thing is that is to be revealed. So, so many things are revealed. So many things are shown. And we sometimes spend hours going through to look at the, what we call apocalyptic events that cause people to worry and to tremble and to fear. We talk about the Antichrist. We talk about everything else. And forget the main focus as to what or who is being revealed. And so, as we go through, we are going to put it into perspective so that we are clear that one, this is not the revelation of St. John, as some of the writers would have put it, but it is in fact the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Very important that we understand and we get it at the early parts of the presentation. And so we, we, we understand that it means a unma an unmasking an unveiling, a revealing, and this is totally different from concealing or hiding. So there is nothing in the book that is to be hidden. There is nothing in the book that God does not want us to understand. And we owe it to ourselves to take the time out and to drill down and to get what is there for us. It is the final work in the New Testament canon and therefore it is a part of the New Testament and a part of the 66 books of the Bible and must be read and clearly understood. So that is important, children of the Most High God. Uh, as we begin and we take our time and we go through, I want us to look at the term, that same Greek term. It is used in other scriptures and look at the meaning. I want us to turn quickly to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse 7. Then I want us to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. I want to show us how the word is used and make the point that it signals or something because we are going to look at this and go back to get the understanding of exactly what is the main feature and focus of the book of Revelation. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, let's, let's bring it on the screen. And let's read together. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1 and verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. It is used here. And notice the word that comes up from its use, usage. Revealed. So, uh, so often it is used in the epistles, as in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, it speaks about a revealing. Very important. So it is a revealing. Then 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, I want us to look at how it is used. That the trials of your faith, or the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance.
appearing of Jesus Christ. So again, it is used in the epistles and it, it, it shows here an appearing. Then Romans chapter 8 and verse 19 tells us a similar thing. The same word used, right? In one instance, it's speaking about a revealing. In another instance, it is speaking and talking about an appearing. And now hear what Romans 8 and verse 19 says. The same word being used. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation. The same word. So in one instance, it is, an, it is a revealing. Then it is an appearing. Then it is a manifestation. It therefore speaks to the unveiling or appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is not the unfolding of a story that the Apostle John is outlining. It is not even fundamentally the, the revelation of prophetical truths. Even though prof prophetical things are there. It speaks about, in Revelation, the Antichrist that is to come. And we spoke about that um, in the earlier part of the year. To the extent that some folks now are looking for Antichrist to come. Some folks are literally at this point, instead of looking for the Lord Jesus Christ, they are looking for Antichrist. They are talking about the things that are happening and the next big thing on the agenda is the coming of the Antichrist. Do not let these things foreshadow the real deal and the main event and the big thing that is to come, saints of God. Right? So it is not even the revelation of prophetical truths. That's not re what revelation is about. Even though it tells us of them and puts us on guard and reveal them to us. But that's not the main feature. And it is important that we understand that. But rather... It is the revelation. It speaks to the revealing, the soon appearing, the manifestation of the glorious Lord Jesus Christ on this earth soon and very soon. Notice Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 is very significant and very powerful in the scheme of things. Revelation 1 and verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is the powerful, this is the feature, this is what revelation is all about. The revealing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he comes back again. Remember now, we are going to those that are in the church, we are going to behold him when he comes for us first. We will be raptured and we will see him and that will be a great revelation for the saints when we are raptured and we go up to meet him in the skies and he take us away. But separate and apart from that, he is going to come in the clouds and according to Revelation 1 and verse 7, every eye shall see him. And this is very significant. This is what it is all about. So we spoke about, we spoke about all these things before and we become lost, easily lost and perturbed with pandemic and fighting over if we should take this and should not take that and fighting over different things and wondering what's next, and arguing over what's next. Insignificant. Insignificant. We, folks are fighting whether the Antichrist is going to come, 
out of Rome or come out of Israel itself. Insignificant. Although the Bible reveals it. And so many times by virtue of the, the serious things that are to come. And as we look through Revelation, we will see them. Yes, the, the famine that is to come. And we spoke about those things already. So we're not stressing on them. And, and, and the wars that are to come. And the, the diseases and pestilence that are to come. And the hunger with the food shortages and so forth that are to come. All of which are sig signified by the horsemen of Revelation. And we look further, as we said a while ago, at the Antichrist. And the things that he is going to do. And the system that he is going to implement. And all that is coming. And we use these things to foreshadow what revelation is all about brothers and sisters all these things will come but these are insignificant in relation to the main event the bible says it is the revelation of jesus christ not merely that jesus is revealing to john what is to come which is also clearly a part of what the revelation is about but it is the revelation of jesus christ himself given what we made mention of in the scriptures that we read a while ago from the epistles a revealing of the lord jesus christ an appearing of the lord jesus christ the manifestation of the lord jesus christ the revelation of jesus christ in the book of Revelation must be understood in the sense of two main things. One, the revelation belongs to him. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It belongs to him. It means that he is the one doing the revealing. And two, he, Jesus, is the object of what is revealed. Yes. So Jesus is the person revealed by the book. He is the main object of revelation. It is talking about all the things, yes. But then what is going to trump everything? Antichrist being here. World system changed into a one world order. Chaos on every hand, trumpets, judgments being poured out via the different instruments that God will use, and all of things, these things will be happening. The great tribulation will be in full swing at a particular point, and all the things in the mix will be happening, and yet none of those represent the main object. Of revelation the main object brothers and sisters and this is what brings peace to the hearts of those that are saved is the revelation the revealing the appearing the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ and that brings joy to our soul very important Yes, and so Revelation is a book of signs. The angels signified it unto John. It is a book that communicates in signs, right? Sign is the first four letters in signify is sign. It is a book that communicates with us through signs and for different reasons. And significant reasons, very important. Uh, it helped John to describe the things he saw in his own language and manner. So he uses signs and symbols so that he could relate easily the things that he saw and put it in his own words and in his own imagery so that it could be understood. Two, the signs are necessary because there is tremendous power in symbolic languages so god wanted the thing 
to come across so that we can understand it. And God has a way all the time. He, he, he used signs and he used little things to bring across a message. One time he, he, he said to a prophet, I want you to take a, 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 a piece of cloth and I want you to tie it up. And another time he said to a prophet, I want you to go down to the potter's house and look through and see what I'm doing. And, and we know another time he used and said to the prophet, um, Ezekiel, I want you to go down and now here's what I want you to do. I want you to not, I want you to eat the dung of the animal. And another time he spoke to some other folks and he just used symbols and signs. And in doing that, it jerks us and frightens us. And at the same time, it brings across the message in a real powerful and fearful way. But using signs and symbols and these things are God's way of allowing the writers to put it together to show that the things are real and significant and also to bring across the thing with impact and force so that they have upon us the impact that he wants it to have. And these are very important. The book of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. About 70% of the book makes some reference to the Old Testament and Jewish symbolism. So it is important that as we take our time and go through the book of Revelation, we understand that signs will come and symbolisms will come and they are there, but not to make the thing difficult, but to impact us when we get to understand and we can and will understand because as we look through the book of Revelation, we are going to use scriptures at different places to interpret scriptures and we will see that the book can be understood and the signs and the symbols that are there are there to bring across the message with force and vigor so that we catch it and we see the seriousness of what is there for us to have now the author of the book of revelation is none other than jesus christ he is the author and yet he indicated to John to write what he was going to show him. So John was merely the scribe. But the author of the book was Jesus Christ himself. Hence, the Bible said the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he is the author. So let us not have any doubts in our mind as to who is responsible for the book. And for the things, folks who go into the book to try to dissect it and to tear it apart, they start to challenge how authentic the Apostle John was. He was the last remaining Apostle at this time, at the time when this book was being written, about AD 95 thereabout. All the other Apostles would have died. He is the only one to have uh, died from natural causes. All the others had gone before him. Some were what they call flayed. They peel the skin off their body and draw them on the peel the skin like when you take a mango skin off the mango. I think that happened to, uh, I don't remember which one of the apostles, but they were flayed. Others had their head cut off like Paul. Peter was crucified upside down. I think Philip, they said, was Trust true with the many swords over in India. And the story, the, the history of the apostles, they all died as martyrs. Practically every one of them. And John the apostle was left. And he was banished to an island where prisoners went. And put in, placed in exile. They tried to kill him too. Dropped him in Buckets are a boiling cauldron of oil. And he went in and he didn't die. And they left him there and he didn't die. God preserved him. And he died. The only one that died a natural death at a, 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 a very ripe old age. But the apostle, in his old age, while banished on that island for prisoners, 
got this revelation from Jesus Christ and he started to write. So he was the scribe and he wrote the things that were there for us to understand. I recognize Jesus in a number of instances telling him, write. And let us look at a few of these scriptures so that we can understand. He was just the scribe. Revelation chapter 1. Look at it quickly and verse 11. Right? Here it is that Jesus is putting the thing together. You know, and Jesus said to him, Revelation 1 and verse 11. Let's read it together. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. Right? So, this is it. so what you say, write it. So Jesus is revealing the things to him. It is the revelation of Jesus. Jesus making it known unto him, but he was instructed to write. Then Revelation 1 and verse 19, go down to 19. You see, in each instance, we are seeing Jesus indicating to him to write. So here Jesus saying again, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Again, he was commanded to write. Then we jump over to Revelation 14 and the verse 13. Right? Jesus is just telling this man to write. Jesus is the author. The apostle himself is the scribe, the writer of the book. And here it is, Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. He is the author. And it is important that we understand that. And I am giving us all of this for a reason. Again in Revelation 19 and verse 9. Revelation 19 and verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage. And he goes on. But again, he was instructed to write. Brothers and sisters, folks will come. Many folks will come. And they will go through a number of things to outline why the book of Revelation is not a book to be studied. Because John had a problem and John was this and John was that. Pay them no mind. John only wrote the things that were shown unto him by Jesus Christ. And all he was is a scribe. If you have a problem with Revelation, don't take it out on John. Go to the author. And the author was none other than Jesus Christ. And it is important. And we maintain that from beginning to, 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 to very end. Very important that we understand that. Now for those individuals who say, for those individuals who continue to believe that the book of Revelation ought not, and is not a book that we can understand, we are going to look at uh, a number of methods that folks actually use to interpret the book of Revelation. And, you know, because there are folks that have different uh, views and they interpret it in different ways and we are going to look at what some of the folks that look at the book of Revelation believe and what they think and there are four main views in terms of how people interpret the book of Revelation uh, the first one they, we, they call it which we will call the spiritual or the allegorical allegory means that it just represents something, but it is not real. It is, it is spiritual. And the, the, what they are basically saying is that the book of Revelation should be spiritualized. And there is really no reference in it to any historical events and anything in the past. And it is just full of pictures and symbols intended to encourage and comfort 
the Christians that were being persecuted in John's day. So that there are those that believe that the things that are written in Revelation, all the things that I have taught and we are talking about and the things that we have looked at and Antichrist is, which is to come, they say there is no such thing as that. Everything in Revelation is supposed to be spiritualized. And when you're talking about some historical thing in the past or something that is to come in the future, no, 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 they say that is not going to happen. The book is nothing but a spiritualized version of things to come. And it is just pictures and symbols. And it was really written only for the people in the day that John was in. Only for them. And so when he wrote, it was just to give them some kind of comfort because they were being persecuted and they were going through a whole lot of things, etc., etc. Uh, and so that is what you call the spiritual uh, stroke allegorical view. They think it is a spiritual thing and nothing more. And the symbols and the pictures are just a means of letting the folks understand what is happening and, and, and see the thing as... Um, explaining that, look, you're going through this, you're under pressure, but what you're seeing here and these symbols that are here are just to present to you that Jesus knows, he understands, and he's comforting you. They spiritualize it and they say what we are talking about as it relates to future events, as it relates to a, 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 a period of persecution to come, what we are seeing as it relates to the Antichrist to come, what we are seeing as it relates to the tribulation period, no such thing. It was just a spiritual thing and nothing to be taken real and literal. And brothers and sisters, you know. Then there's a second view. They call it the preterist view. And in this interpretation of the book of Revelation, it, it presents that revelation as already been fulfilled in the early history of the church. It describes John's current day. You know, what John was going through and all the things that was happening in his time. Yes, they, they looked at it and say that it was placed in symbolic code so that those that were outside the Christian family couldn't understand it. So what they were saying is that it was almost like a, a, a secret writing, a coded writing. And only the people in John's day could understand the code. Those that were outside of the church would just see it as something fanciful and that makes no sense. But those in the church... In the day that John was in when he was writing and the people were being persecuted, just like John. John had to, was banished at the island called Patmos. It was a time of persecution. So he was sent there. Others were underground. Others had to run and hide in all kinds of places. And this period of persecution, yes, they believe the, the, this particular view took it that these people were writing in codes and all of these things that we are looking at, the symbols and all, they were just coded messages that the people in John's time, and it was only for that time, and they understood what it was about. But it was not for Christians, even today Christians. It is totally not for us. And that is the view that those persons hold. Then there is a third view called the historical view. And in this historical view, it deals with the whole period of church history from John's time to the end of the world till Jesus comes, right? And it looks at the church and it's, it, it kind of outlines that the church went through different stages and different uh, periods and therefore what happened in John's time represented, for example, the first church, the uh, church, that the Bible spoke about the first of the seven churches and what happened after John's time would represent the second of the seven churches and what happened in, in the third church 
out of the seven churches represent a different church here. It looks at Revelation as a historical book and deal with the whole period of church history from John's time to the end of the world. And that is that particular view. They call it the historical view. But then there is a fourth view, another view. They call that view the, the futurist view. And they interpret the book in this way, right? They affirm that the major part of the book deal with what is still future, what is to come, right? It deals with the Lord's coming and the judgment, yes? And that will still take place in the future. And that is what we have been presenting to us. Some things were already passed. But a lot of the things represents things that are yet future. Coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Antichrist on earth, the tribulation period, the time of judgment to come. All these are future things. And we know it. And as we look and map what is happening in our world with what is written in Bible, in the book, we see some things literally coming together. And we can easily know that this particular viewpoint uh, is quite easily the one that we would embrace. Yes? And so we will have these differing views on the book of Revelation, but understand that, brothers and sisters, while some of the things were passed, because the Bible... The scriptures right here in Revelation broke it down into three areas. And this is the key to understanding the book of Revelation. Key. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. And I want us to take time and look at this again because this is now the key. So though folks have differing views and we looked at the, the four main views, people come up with these differing views simply because there is a misunderstanding of some of the fundamental things. And one of the key, the fundamental in understanding the book of Revelation is to see that the thing is broken up into sections. And Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19 presents to us the key in understanding the book. So we're just going through a little background before we jump into some things um, in Revelation, still into the introductory part, giving us a background, but it is important that we grasp and understand the key so that we can understand which view we should embrace. And then from there, we move on into the thing. So Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. Let's read it um, together. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So that we are seeing here a three-part division as we study the books. And we ought to therefore, as we go through, study the books in these three parts. So, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19 represents a key in understanding the book. So the things which thou hast seen. And Revelation chapter 1 takes care of that. The things that are past. The things which thou hast seen. These things are past. Revelation chapter 1 examines that. Now, the second division is the things which are. In other words, the things which are present. So, the first division looks at things that were past, which is Revelation chapter 1. The second division looks at things which are, which are the things that are present. And Revelation chapter number 2 and number 3 deals with that. And we, here we find the seven churches and a number of things. But it was speaking about the things which are present. So we are looking at the division 
of the book. And this holds the key to understanding. So we looked at the first division, which spoke to the things which thou hast seen. That means things which are past. Revelation 1 deals with that. The second division, the things which are, which speaks to the present thing at the time when it, it was being written. And Revelation, chap, Revelation chapter number 2 and number 3 speak to that. And then the third division, the third part, makes reference to the things which shall be hereafter. In other words, things which are future. And Revelation chapter 4, right through to chapter 22, speak of the future things. And it is so very, very important that we take time and deal with that breakdown. Just to appreciate that division is so very important. It is important that we understand as we look at a few little rules for biblical interpretation. One, that scripture must interpret scripture. Very important. Two, when interpreting scripture, one must always take the literal interpretation first. Right? And, and we're just looking at some basic rules for biblical interpretation. Three, all prophecy in scripture was given by God to be understood. So let us get away from the notion that God would have given us things that he did not want us to understand. No. When God gives prophet, prophecy and in, gives scriptures, they were firstly given by God and understand that they were given so that we can understand them. Four, we must consult the help given to us by God to understand the prophetic word, right? We see this outline in St. John 14, 20, verse 26, and we see this outline in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 7. And then finally, where the Bible is silent, let it remain silent. Never argue from silence. So if the Bible does not open up on certain things or is silent on certain things, we must not try to extract from that silence and establish an argument around that. All right? Very important. So let's, let me just run back through those five basic elementary rules of biblical interpretations because we are going to need this as we go on and get into the book of Revelation a little bit deeper. One, scriptures must interpret scriptures. Two, when interpreting scripture, one takes the literal interpretation first. Three, all prophecy in scripture was given by God to be understood. Four, we must consult the help given to us by God to understand the prophetic word. And two scriptures are used here to make this point. One of the scriptures is St. John 14, verse 26. The other one is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. Okay, and then the, the last rule that we have here is where the Bible is silent, let it remain silent. Don't argue, never argue from silence. And it is important that we understand and appreciate that. Very important. So... That being said, I, I am going to gear up to wrap up the introduction tonight. 
I did say I would not go my regular time, which is regular uh, normally for me two hours a little bit beyond. But I'm going to move to wrap up just this little introductory because I wanted to set a little background for us so that we move in to the areas in Revelation that I want us to focus on. I am going to spend some time on the seven churches. Uh, that is going to be where quite a bit of my emphasis and focus is. Other things I will touch on, but I won't go into the thing in relation to the prophetical part or the Bible prophecy part because we spend quite a while doing that. But there, there is so much for us to extract from this book outside of the straight Bible prophecy and I want us to go there and I establish this background so that we can be geared in our minds brothers and sisters as we move to go in especially to chapters 2 and 3 which deals with the seven churches and I want us to spend a little bit of time there but the book is a very interesting book and every child of God must take the time out as we go through these um, chapters and verses and what we will present from the book so that we can have a clear grasp and understanding. But just to make the point again, which I wanted to make in the introduction, while all the things that we have spoken about and all the things that we have heard about cause us to look at Revelation and the book is called uh, the, the Apocalypse because it speaks about certain end time things, apocalyptic events that are to come and when we hear of those things we think of everything from Antichrist down to the, the, the as he rides on the white horse down to the famine and the all the things that we spoke about. We think of the judgments that are going to be poured out. We think of all the catastrophic things that are going to happen not only to the Jewish people who would have been receiving the judgment for what they did to Messiah along with a whole lot of other things. When we look at Revelation, all of these things cross our minds and we call this thing the apocalypse. We look at the Armageddon and the, the terrible war that is going to be fought in the end times. But yet, while these are things mentioned in the book of Revelation, it is not the reason for the book of Revelation be, being written. The revelation of Jesus Christ literally is that. It speaks to all these things happening, but what is going to be the crowning glory, what is going to be the event of greatest impact, what is going to be the event of greatest significance is not the coming of the Antichrist. It's not all the judgment that is going to be poured out. It's not the pandemic sweeping through and causing changes to ushering the new world order. No, no, no. It is the revealing. It is the manifestation. It is the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everything else that is written in Revelation is peripheral to that main event. So folks today who are trembling and nervous and in corners and don't know what is happening around us, let us come out of our corners. This is a time for celebration because if this is ushering in, as many believe, last day's events, then guess what? Soon and very soon, we are going to, one, first be raptured and two, coming back with Jesus Christ when he burst the cloud and put in his glorious appear, appearing. Hence, revelation will be fulfilled. This is a time of rejoicing. This is a time when we should be on top of the world. This is a time when we should be, those knees that are weak should be, become strong because we are in a period. We believe. And if this is not even the end of the end, we know that this is ushering in us into a new dimension, a new period, a new 
atmosphere that no doubt will ultimately usher us down to what we will be looking at are some of the things that we will be looking at in the book of Revelation. So we kind of conclude this overview for the evening and God's willing we get back together next week Wednesday so that we can move on into Revelation certainly in the areas that I want to take us and we can extract what we must so that we can enhance ourselves, we can build ourselves, and we can make our calling and election sure. God bless you, brothers and sisters, as we bring the curtains down for this overview of the book of Revelation, and we pick up next week, God's willing, same time, same place. God bless you. Before I go, I would like to have us to be in constant prayer. We give God thanks. Um, our brothers and sisters who were ill, you know, some with the, a touch of the, the COVID virus, that COVID virus that is causing challenges here and there and has actually caused death to even within, even within our own midst. midst. We give God thanks that our brothers and sisters who might have contracted the virus have had it out of their systems now. And they were in the hospital, they are out of the hospital. And we give God thanks, we give him praise, we give him glory. And we ask us just to continue to pray for the saints, pray for the children of God, lift up each other. We are living in serious times and I want us to take this period that we are in very seriously. I don't care what your position might be on the vaccine. What I want to say is this, brothers and sisters, the virus is real. Now, if anybody is tricking us, they can trick. If anybody is trying to sanctify us, they can samphy. But the virus is real. And the virus has caused death. And those whom we know has died. It's not fake death. They're not tricking us. They're dead. And those who we know are sick. They're not tricking us. They were sick. And when they, they, they complain of lung pain and can't breathe, they, they weren't tricking us. They weren't samphying us real it therefore means that there is a virus out there that i i am imploring all god's children to take very best care as best as we can take be cautious take every precaution and do what we must to protect ourselves the thing is real as we go through, I might, in the presentation, as we do the study in Revelation, just for the purpose of clarity, I will just take a little bit of time and explain again the mark of the beast, the significance of it, how it is going to happen, what it is intended to achieve, so that we are clear in our minds that we are not mixing up the mark of the beast with a vaccine. Irrespective of what anybody is saying, we want to be clear on that so that folks can understand that this virus is real, whereas it might be precipitating something else, the vaccine is not and cannot be the mark of the beast. So I will go through so that we can have that clear. And for those that think otherwise, well, um, I leave you to your own vices. But just to make that clear, for God, for the children, for the people of God, so that we are clear in our minds. And, you know, it, it is a time of uncertainty. And as best as we can, we want to help and, and, and create a sense of balance and clarity to the issues that are at hand. And take time out to pray one for the other, and that God cover us, all right? 
So bear that in mind. The Lord bless you. And I also want us to pray, brothers and sisters, for uh, the sanctuary that God give us a place. Uh, again, we heard from the authorities. And again, I said it a, a couple of weeks or a few months ago that the, the feedback that we got was not positive. And a lot of folks came and said, Sir, well, what is it? does that mean that we might not get the place? And I said, well, it's not positive. And brothers and sisters, we heard again um, just a matter of days ago. And again, the feedback is certainly not positive. But we serve a great, big, wonderful God. And if he is saving people, I don't worry about where they are going to go. I leave that to God to plan and to organize and to prepare. But I ask all of us to let's keep praying. If it is there, it is there. If it is not there, it is not there. But God has to open a door. And let's pray that God open a door so that we are settled and um, whichever way it goes, the people of God will have a sanctuary in which to worship. So let us pray. I ask the prayer groups to pray. I ask the, all the intercession, intercessors to pray. I ask everybody, let's join in, in prayer so that, you know, God open a door. And although the sounding is not good, the, 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 the what you call it now, the diagnosis at the end of the day, is going to have to be good because God's work must go on. Amen? So be prayerful, be vigilant. Let us see what God is going to do, which door he's going to open, how he's going to do the thing. This is a time for miraculous things to happen. And we pray for the miraculous. God bless you. And let's keep praying one for the other. Let's keep praying for the body, the church, the local assembly. Let's keep praying for the saints right across who join us uh, from across the globe in Bible study, in Sunday service. And I ask all of us, let's pray that the will of the Lord be done. God bless you. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father, we come before your great presence. We thank you one more time for this privilege, for this opportunity to magnify you, to glorify you, to, to lift you up, Lord. Thank you for your words. Thank you for the introduction this afternoon, this evening. I pray, Father in heaven, that as simple as the introduction is, help us to understand and to see the significance, even from the introduction of this book of Revelation. Help us to open our hearts and our minds to accept and to receive this word so that our hearts can be edified, our lives can be built, and we can be better prepared, O oh great God, to set our houses in order as we anticipate and expect the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless your great name. We magnify you, mighty God. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you real good. And God's willing, next week, same time, we continue on uh, in this book of Revelation. In Jesus' name, praise God. God bless you.